Caribbean insight, ready is dynamite. Caribbean insight, really super for spite. Caribbean insight, enjoy day or night. Caribbean insight, really is dynamite. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Tim Tim Show. Um, the Tim Tim Show is all about storytelling. You know, in the old days, people spoke to each other. Mothers spoke to daughters, fathers spoke to sons, and the whole family used to get together to tell stories. And the things I do, the Tim Tim stories I tell, these things I do to help recreate that atmosphere of the old days, where we were all one people, one family, storytelling. And tonight, is so, I'm so happy that you're all here, because this is the sort of setting that we had in the old days. A small place, nice people, and the atmosphere for storytelling. But you see, the storytellers were always polite people. They never just opened their mouth and start to talk. You know, nowadays, people don't have no respect. <laughs> Come to your house, open your fridge, <laughs> take out things and drink it, then tell you they don't like that brand, why you don't buy a next brand? <laughs> or they come to your drawing room and take off their slippers and start to play with their toes, you know? <laughs> that sort of thing. But the old storytellers used to be very polite. They never started to speak without asking permission to, tell the, to, to speak or to tell the story. So sometimes they started their stories with once upon a time. In Jamaica, they say, Jack Mandora Mina choose none. Because according to the Jamaicans, it's not St. Peter in charge of heaven, it's a Jamaican. <laughs> so when they say Mina choose none, they mean they're not taking any side in the story, so they're not responsible for the bad things in the story. And this is something that the storyteller always does before he speaks. He tells you that he's not responsible for what he's going to say. <laughs> and that is something that politicians should learn. <laughs> so you see, the storytellers always set the scene by clearing themselves of all responsibility for the bad things in the story, and then saying that they're not responsible, they're just passing on what they're hearing downtown, right? In some places, they say, his tongue say so, or school children say, or them say, or he say and she say. In the French islands, because of the patois, they say Tim Tim, and the crowd says Wasesh, and the storyteller says Tout ça qui vaut bon Dieu, mettez sous la terre. <laughs> and that in patois means all the good things on earth is God put it there. Again, the storyteller is saying to God, all the good things in the story belong to you. So he's sweet talking God, so God will do nothing to him. <laughs> So tonight I say to you, Tim Tim Boasesh, and we're going to have a nice evening of storytelling. Right on. So now I'm coming down to join you from the top of the steps to the bottom of the steps. Because I know a lot of you think that it's easy to be a storyteller. They say, well, anybody could go out and talk, man. It's only old talky talking. Anybody could do that. But it's not easy to be a storyteller. Because to be a storyteller, you have to have certain attributes. In the first place, you have to know how to pronounce your words. It's no sense going on the stage if you can't pronounce properly. <laughs> so let nobody tell you because you're doing dialect that you don't have to pronounce the dialect properly because you're trying to get a certain effect. So if you want to say them say, you have to say them say, not them say. <laughs> right? That's English. You say dem, so you have to put your mouth the same way to get the D and the dem and the emphasis. So you have to know how to pronounce your words. Like the fellow who went to get a job doing terrazzo. Now, terrazzo is the thing they put on the floor to make it look nice and smooth. But when he went out on the first job, he couldn't remember how to say terrazzo. He watched the woman, he said, Madam, I come to terrorize your floor. <laughs> He lost that job because he could not pronounce his words. Then it's very important that you know where to put the emphasis on the word. You see, in the Caribbean, we use our voice as an instrument. You know, like you have the saxophone and the xylophone and the drum and the guitar. 
Well, the storyteller's voice is his instrument. Um, and in the Caribbean, we use the voice in a particular way. We put the emphasis on certain parts of the word when we want to get a different meaning. Take the word bad. If you want to say something is rotten, you say it bad. If you want to say it macho, you say it bad. <laughs> right? If you want to say it cool, you say it bad, you know, bad. <laughs> so you have bad, bad, and bad. All meaning different things depending on where you put the emphasis on the word. So it's very important in communicating as a storyteller that you know where to put the emphasis on the word. Like a friend of mine who had a sentence to say in a play, and it went like this, uh, what is that in the road ahead? If you hear it. <laughs> what is that in the road ahead? <laughs> so, so you see, where you put the emphasis on the word is very important as far as what the meaning of the word is. Then to be a good storyteller, you also have to be a good listener. You know, we in the West Indies talk too much. We love to talk, but we don't like to listen. We answer questions before people even ask them we answer. <laughs> we so want to talk that we don't even give you a chance to finish what you're saying, we start talking. So it's not strange to see five people talking to each other all at the same time. And they're not listening to anything anybody's saying. So you have to know how to be a good listener if you're going to be a good talker. For instance, when I went to school in the college there, we used to say the 23rd Psalm. And there was this line that went, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And it was only about last year I found out who Shirley was. <laughs> lot of college boys who walk around today believing that there's somebody called Shirley in the Bible <laughs> because we are hearing Shirley when we should have been hearing Shirley you know that sort of thing so you have to be a very good listener if you're going to be able to pass on information you have to pick up the right thing but you know parents are very sort of prejudiced towards people like storytellers poets and these sort of people you know you go and tell your father, he says, um, son, what you want to be? You say, I want to be a comedian. You can say, all right, one of these days you'll grow to that. Don't worry, you will grow up one day. <laughs> you see, if you want to be an engineer, or a doctor, or a lawyer, supervisor, <laughs> interior decorator, <laughs> anything with er in it is all right. But if you tell them you want to be a comedian, a storyteller, a poet, they don't understand where this thing is going to get you. A friend of mine went to England to study acting. Now his mother was dead set against acting. She says, boy, you can't make no money acting. What are you going to England to do? He didn't take her on. He went to London. But six weeks later, he write back home asking for 200 pounds. <laughs> she write back telling him, act as if you have 200 pounds. <laughs> To be this thing you call a storyteller, you have a lot of basic problems from the beginning. You also have things like the name. You know, you have to get a name to be a stage personality. You have to be like Mighty Sparrow, Lord Melody, Tim Tim, Miss Lou. You know, all of us take names because it helps on the stage. But the names can cause problems, especially if you're a Calypsonian. And a Calypsonian is also a type of storyteller, except he's singing. Um, you have problems when you go to England and Barbados and places like that when they believe in things like the real law this and lady that and so on. For instance, the other day, Sir Ellis Clark, the president of Trinidad, was going through the customs in Barbados. And I hear one custom officer tell the next custom officer, oh, that is Sir Ellis Clark, you know. So let's say, you see them damn Calypsonians, only one special treatment. <laughs> The names can cause problems and then you know sometimes we like to shorten the name to get a certain effect like you know for Howard University you have Howard U for Boston University you have Boston U Harvard University you have Harvard U 
But I heard the Falkland Islands wanted to have a university, so they had problems. <laughs> There's a lot more to this thing we call storytelling than meets the eye. Then you have to have a good memory. You see, you cannot go on the stage and forget what you're going to talk about. I've seen many great speakers stand up to make a brilliant speech and halfway through they can't remember exactly what they were going to say. They panic. But you cannot do that when you go on the stage. You have to have your thing together. You can't forget which part of the story comes first, which part comes second. Like the fellow who bought the horse from the priest. <laughs> he went to the priest and the priest told him, I've trained my horse. When I wanted to go fast, I said, praise be the Lord. When I wanted to stop, I said, amen. The fellow said, no problem, give me the horse. So he get the horse. Going down the road, he decided to try it out. He bawled, praise be the Lord. The horse take off and it start to go, it start to go, heading for a precipice. As the boat to go over, he bawled, amen. The horse stopped. He's so happy, he bawled, praise be the Lord. <laughs> So you see, it's something that you must remember all the time, that the storyteller has to have good memory. Then, it's also important that you know when to open your mouth and when not to open your mouth. Now that goes not only for storytellers, but for everybody in life. Priests, politicians, everybody. You have to know when to say the right thing and when not to say it, which audience you're talking to, which audience will accept this, which audience will not accept that. Like the fellow who bought um, he fell off a precipice, you know, and down the precipice, and the police came to pull him out. So the policeman says, tie the rope round your foot. He say, boy, my foot mash up fine, 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 fine. <laughs> police say, how about your hand? He say, oh, boy, my hand mash up, I can't even see it. If you see my hand, it mash up fine, 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 fine. He say, how about your waist? He say, well, my winding day is over, you know. <laughs> policeman say, how about your teeth? He say, my teeth all right. So the policeman dropped down the rope and he say, bite onto it, I'm going to pull you up. Drop down the rope, fella bite onto it, police start pulling him up. Everything going fine till he reached near the top. Police say, how are you doing? He say, all right, man. when to open your mouth and when not to open your mouth. And then it's also important that you keep your wits about you. You can't panic. Because sometimes on stage, they may be filming you and they may have to change the film and things like that. You can't panic, you have to be cool, you know what I mean? Or sometimes, you know, as we are storytellers, we are not the normal type of poet who stands at the university and reads poetry for a captive audience. We take poetry and storytelling to the people. But remember, we take it to them. Them and send and call us. <laughs> so when you go out to the people, you have to accept the people the way you meet them. So sometimes BWI flying over your head, dogs running through the hall, church bells ringing, pigeons doing things on your head. <laughs> All kinds of things can happen in these type of situations when you're outdoor or you're out in the villages, countryside doing storytelling. So you have to know how to cope with the audience. You can't panic and forget you know, what you're doing and so on. Like during the invasion here, I understand tree fellas climb up some trees to hide. So when the Americans come under the first tree, they say, who's up there? First fella ball, coo. <laughs> so they say, oh, that's only a little bird. Second tree, who's up there? Hear the fella, meow. <laughs> or they say, oh, that's only a little cat. Third tree, who's up there? Hear the fella, moo. <laughs> We all know that cows don't climb trees. So you have to keep your wits about you. Same thing happened to some friends of mine in England. You know, England has some very strange laws. In England, there's a law called sus, which means they arrest you because you look as if you're going to do something. That means you look suspicious, so they pick you up on suspicion. Well, you know how the West Indians who land in England look suspicious. <laughs> From the time they come off the plane and they start looking around at Buckingham Palace and Westminster Abbey and they're looking around, they look very suspicious. So, so police picking up one after the other <laughs> in the van. 
So the police pick up three fellas and they decide they're not giving their name. They say, let the police find out the name for themselves. <laughs> so when the police ask the first fellow, what's your name? He looked wrong. He see Woolworths. He said, F.W. Woolworths, sir. <laughs> Policeman write that down. Second fellow, what's your name? He looked wrong. He see Marks and Spencer. He said, Mark Spencer, sir. <laughs> police write it down. Third fellow, what's your name? He looked wrong. Kentucky Fried Chicken, sir. <laughs> your wits about you when you're in this sort of situation. You know, you have to be graceful and use your body and so on on the stage. Sometimes you may throw a bottle or two at you, but you must exit very gracefully. Don't let the bottle hit you. Keep just one inch ahead of the bottle. But you know, don't panic around on the stage. Keep your cool. Then you know, we West Indians love to talk with our bodies, our hands. You know, if you want to stop a West Indian from talking, don't tie him out. Tie your hand. <laughs> because you tie a West Indian hand, he can't talk. <laughs> so police always make that mistake tying fellas mouth and things. Don't tie fellas mouth. Tie their hand and they can't talk. Because you know, we talk with our hands. We like to say things are long, 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 and tall, 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 and short, 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 and wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> but when you are on the radio, you have problems because nobody can see your hand. <laughs> And that's where the voice becomes very important. Because depending on how you say what you're going to say, that's the impression you're going to give the audience listening at home. So you have to know how to use your voice when you convey messages. That goes for cricket commentators and all these kind of people. You have to give the perfect description so people get the real picture of what you're talking about. But the other day, a big match going on between Trinidad, no, not Trinidad, West Indies versus India. Test match going on. Lady running our house balling, put off the radio pornography on the radio. We say, but madam, how you know they have pornography on the radio? It's just a little test match going on between West Indies and India. She say how oh, Ghana bowling without underpants. <laughs> I say, but madam, how you know Ghana bowling without underpants? She say she hear the radio man say that. I say, what is he? She say, she hear him say how. Oh, Ghana getting his balls to swing both ways. <laughs> no. You see, so the way the way you say things can be very misleading. So you have to be very careful when you're speaking to people or when you're lecturing or talking to people that you use the right language and you convey the right message. And this is a part of the problem we have in communicating. People talk one thing and people hear a different thing. So you always have to double check with your audiences to figure out if they understand what you really said. Because everybody say, yes, man, we understand. I'm going to go write down everybody have done the wrong thing. So you see, to be a storyteller, you have to have a lot of attributes. To be a poet, to be anybody who goes on stage, you have to have a good memory, you have to have uh, uh, you know, the ability to pronounce words, you have to have a good memory, you can't panic, you know, you have to have all these things. But most of all, you must be grateful to your audiences, because these are the people who come out to support you. You must never forget the audiences or the spiritual world. Because wherever we gather, as we gather here tonight, the spirits are gathered with us, the ancestors. You see, storytelling is a spiritual thing. Wherever we gather to tell the old tales of the old folks, the history of our people, the spirits come. So they are very much present when we all gather together. So you must never forget, any time you do anything concerning your own people, that you say a little thank you to the spirits. But you also have to know how to say thank you. <laughs> Like the fellow after a big graduation speech, stand up to thank the audience, he says, and he says, uh, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, and my wife thanks you from her bottom also. <laughs> so you see, it is very important that you begin a show and end the show properly. Wonder Woman, the Hulk, 
the bulk. <laughs> you know, the children are being given this sort of thing. When we have characters that belong to the Caribbean that are just as important and just as fascinating, things like La Jablesse. You see the La Jablesse? The La Jablesse is a devil woman. And she always wearing a long dress right down to the ground. Because she has one good foot and one cow foot. And she wearing a long dress so you can't see the cow foot. And nowadays I hear La Jablesse wearing pants suit. <laughs> So look to your left and look to your right. You might be sitting down next to La Jablesse right now. No, I'm not trying to frighten you all. I know some of you have to go far. But we have these kind of characters that you may meet any part of the road when you walk in. They have one in Trinidad they call it Dwen. Now the Dwen is the spirit of the child who died without getting baptized. And the Dwen foot turned before behind. So you can't tell if I went coming or it going. <laughs> then, well, in Barbados, you know, Bajans have to be different. They're very British. They have something called steel donkey. Barbados is the only island with an industrial jumbie. <laughs> they got a steel. And the Jamaicans not too far behind. They have rolling car. They say this car has come through the bush at night, chain clanking and fire coming out of the eye and so on, just like a steel donkey. Well, Grenada and then places like that, they have the French jumbies. You know, we have colonialism even down among them jumbies and so on. We have Spanish jumbie, French jumbie, English jumbie and so on and so on. In Grenada, they have one called Mama Malade. No, that one, bad. You see, the Mama Malade is the spirit of the woman who died in childbirth. And the spirit always looking for the child. So on a dark night, you hear it coming down the road bawling, mm. And if you ever look outside, it's gone, you gone. <laughs> Mama Malady taking you for the child. Now, women always get in catch with that. They don't have no child outside. But they're looking outside to see who child cry. <laughs> now, if a man do that, I could understand. Because man have plenty outside child. <laughs> so, if a man look outside for a child, I could understand that, but not a woman. Well, in Guyana, they have some jumbies in Guyana. You know, Guyana have all kind of bush and water, so plenty room for jumbie to organize them there. <laughs> the only thing I afraid more than jumbie in Guyana is mosquitoes. <laughs> Guyana have some mosquito when you meet them, you have to say good morning. <laughs> a fellow tell me the mosquitoes in Guyana don't fly, they take taxi to come down. <laughs> but they like to lie, you know them Guyanese just lie sometimes. Then in Guyana they have one they call the Baku. The Baku, they say, is a little man in a bottle, like a genie. And they say, if you get this bottle and you open it and you let out this Baku, the Baku will get, get you help, help you get money and power and all kind of things. So politicians love Baku and things as well. <laughs> the only trouble is after you let out the Baku, you can't get it to go back in the bottle. So if you don't know how to control the Baku, Baku does control you. So if you ever go to Guyana and you see a bottle on the ground, don't pick it up. Because all you can hear somebody say, thank you very much. <laughs> and after that, it's you and Baku to catch. <laughs> now they have one they call it Supiya. You all know Supriya. Supriya is the old woman who take off her skin and fly at night like a ball of fire across the sky. And when you wake up in the morning, you have a little mark on your neck, you all say it's a hickey. Well, it's not a hickey. <laughs> Supriya suck you all right there, <laughs> like Dracula. Well, in St. Kitts and these small islands, since Caricom come, all the jumbies leave. <laughs> they in London and Toronto and all kinds of places. American immigration looking for plenty West Indians. But it's not West Indians, it's larger bless and thing going through customs. No green card. So when they talk about the amount of people in America who storm, who stowe and so on, it's only larger bless. Never find them. It's Baku and all them kind of things. And with CARICOM now, the same thing happening. All jumbies come down Grenada, they go on Jamaica, they go on all them kind of big places, right? They like nice life. Jumbies going up there. The only jumbies I find in St. Kitts is a jumbie they call the rum jumbie. <laughs> now rum jumbie is a fella who does drink plenty rum and he ugly. <laughs> a lot of fellas you see sitting down here, 
looking ugly. They didn't born so yeah. <laughs> A lot of ugly fellas in this room tonight is rum make them ugly. <laughs> I mean, you know, when you take a good drink of strong rum, and you got to make up your face like that to swallow. <laughs> well, my God. If you do that every day for 40 years, you're bound to get ugly. <laughs> so you hear them say rum is macho, rum is not macho. Rum is ugly to make fellas get ugly. <laughs> well, the one I want to talk last about is the one they call the Phantom in Trinidad. They say the Phantom is a man about 40 foot tall. And he stand up right across the road like that on a dark night. And they say, anybody you pass between your leg, you just do so. And he mash you up, fine, 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 fine. <laughs> but what I want to know is who's so stupid to see a man 40 foot tall in the middle of the road on a dark night no pass between the legs. <laughs> but you know some Trinidadians will do that. <laughs> hey, hey. Who put this thing here, boy? This is a Minchel Massa one. of the underworld, we also have the characters of the upper world, right? You have fellas like Dr. Aa -A <laughs> and Slim and Tall Boy. Well, you see, ever since I wrote that story about how Slim lost all he teeth, people are always coming and ask me, how come Slim lost all he teeth? Well, let me tell you all how come Slim lost all he teeth. Once upon a time, before your time, before my time, before anybody's time, <laughs> Slim had 30 of the best Trinidadian teeth in his mouth. They say when Slim smiled was like a piano open. <laughs> Slim even win a Mr. Teeth contest in Barbados. They say that was the biggest teeth contest in the whole Caribbean. People who couldn't come send the teeth. <laughs> So you know, was no ordinary teeth contest Slim win. But from the time you win the contest, it's like you get blight. You start to lose your teeth five by five. He lose the first five in a fight with a fella called Sledge. He interfere with Sledge woman. Sledge cough him in the mouth, he lose five teeth. He lose the next five going up the Princess Margaret Highway. Taxi driver as usual, no signal, stop sudden. Slim car hit the taxi, Slim mode hit the steering wheel, and five of Slim bestie take off. He lose ten eating roast corn wrong the savant. <laughs> My God, Slim buy a roast corn. I mean a hard roast corn. When I tell you a hard roast corn, I mean a hard roast corn. The corn look like it no escape from the central market. Slim take a bite, he lose five teeth. He said, I can't believe it, he take a next bite. <laughs> he lose five four. So by this time now, Slim only have about five teeth left in his mouth, and they scatter on him out. Slim mouth look as if he was eating dynamite, and they blob him out. So one morning, you know sometimes, when your teeth scatter on your mouth, and you have a toothache, you really can't tell which teeth hurting you. Because sometimes you feel the pain on the left side, and the right side is bad. And sometimes you feel the pain on the right side and his left side is bad. So one morning, Slim wake up, <coughs> his teeth scatter so much wrong him out. Have a toothache, he can't tell which teeth hurt again. So he decided to go to a dentist called Dr. A-A. Ah <laughs> now I have to tell you about Dr. A-A. Ah they call him Dr. A-A ah because he always says A-A ah before he say anything. <laughs> He said, but ah, what is wrong with your mouth? You look like you were eating dynamite. But that is not a problem, Dr. Ah can fix that. That is not a problem, let me try. So Dr. Ah take a pliers into slim mode. But ah, I make a mistake. I'm so sorry, I make a mistake. <laughs> let me try another time. But ah, I make a next mistake. Well, by the time Dr. Ah finished with slim, slim don't have one teeth in his mouth. Dr. R said, but ah, that is not a problem at all, at all, at all. That is not a problem. Dr. R can fix anything. So Dr. R bring out a teeth book. If you see Dr. R teeth book, he had dog teeth, rat teeth, cat teeth, home teeth, he had all kind of teeth. 
He tells Slim, shoot. Slim take five of each. <laughs> and they order a plate. Well, boy, one month pass, Slim can't see teeth reach. Two months pass, he can't see teeth reach. Third month, one morning, he wake up, you read the paper, you see, custom officer get back. <laughs> that is when Slim know he teeth reach customs. So he gone on to the customs looking for his teeth. Well, you know, somebody get to the box before Slim and the teeth half his teeth. When he opened the box, only three teeth in the box. Two back teeth and one front teeth. So Slim bring the three teeth to Dr. R. Dr. R said, but well, ah, that is not a problem at all, at all, at all. That is not a problem. All you have to do is put the two back teeth in the front and the one front teeth in the top. So Slim put the two back teeth in the front and the one front teeth in the top. Slim walk, you know, he's looking like a plug. <laughs> well, Slim so proud of he plug mouth now. He decided to go to a fet in Chinese Association. Big carnival fet, about 10,000 Chinese. You know, Chinese small, look like 20,000. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes when you have a heart transplant, the body does reject the heart. Well, in the middle of the fet, Slim mouth reject all the teeth. <laughs> Feather say, you just see take off, boom, and teeth gone. So Slim run to the MC, say, stop the fed, stop the fed. MC say, what is wrong? He say, I lost the teeth, man. So the MC stopped the fed. He say, ladies and gentlemen, a man has just lost three teeth, two back teeth and one front teeth. I would be very grateful if you all could look on the ground and see if you all find the man teeth. Boy, people start to cuss. 10,000 Chinese looking for three teeth. <laughs> a man find three teeth, bring it for Slim. Slim say, that is not you, that is somebody else. <laughs> The MC said, teeth is teeth, start the fet. <laughs> so Slim take the three teeth and he bring it back to Dr. Ah uh -uh. Dr. Ah uh -uh said, but ah, uh, I see the problem, I see the problem. <laughs> you see, what really happened is that when you took your collection of teeth, you took some dog teeth and some cat teeth. <laughs> so what you had left in your mouth was two dog teeth and one cat teeth. And you know, dog do not like cat. <laughs> so what you had in your mouth was a dog fight. And what really happened is the two dog teeth chase the cat teeth out your mouth. <laughs> Do you want the next teeth? Then say, ah ah. I'm Lady V and I hope you enjoyed the ride. Remember, you need to subscribe, like and share to keep the culture alive. I'll catch you at the next pit stop.